You're listening to Part of the Problem on the Gas Digital Network. I can be the freest country in the world when you lock more of your own people in cages than any other country in the world. The lesson of 9-11 should have been to never fund another young rebel group in this part of the world again. America started as the smallest government in history, and it's become the biggest government in world history. At the end of the day, it's all about freedom. Here's your host, Dave Smith. A part of the problem, I am of course Dave Smith. I'm out of the studio pre-recording uh, this episode at home because I'm going to be at the Soho Forum tonight uh, opening up the, uh, the debate series, uh, which is a debate on uh, sexual assault on college campus. A nice, juicy topic. I think you guys can already guess how I feel about the subject. Pro-sexual assault. Been, been there for many years. Just trying to stay consistent. What can I say? Uh, okay, so anyway, I'm going to be at that. And then um, it, right after I record this, i got to run over and do uh, Bennington, which is one of my favorite radio shows in the world. And uh, I'm doing that with Lewis to promote our gigs this weekend. We'll be in Boston at Nick's Comedy Stop on the 23rd and the 24th. So if you're in the Boston area, come check us out there. And then, of course, next week I will be in Los Angeles, uh, 28th and 29th at the Comedy Store with the Legion of Skanks. And then on the 31st, I'm doing a, uh, a libertarian meetup kind of hangout thing with uh, Jason Stapleton and the boys from the Lines of Liberty podcast, Mark and Brian. Very excited to do that. Again, you can, you can come check us out there. So that should be a lot of fun. Hang out, grab a drink, talk liberty. And um, yeah, I'm excited to go do all of that stuff. I'm also going to try to, uh, I got to text Michael Bolden today, see if maybe he can pop by that thing, because that would be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, anyway, so this is going to be a little bit of a shorter episode. I apologize for that. But, you know, look at things on the bright side. I'm making sure to get you guys an episode, even when I have a busy schedule, which I know none of you remember, but I have, uh, I have failed to do that a few times in the past. So, trying to, trying to improve. Um, so anyway, I, I thought, uh, you know, I, I woke up this morning and I, you know, turned on the, the cable news because I, I love pain. And, um, you know, God, it's just, it's the hilarious shit show that it always is. And there weren't really any, any topics that were particularly jumping out at me that I felt like really needed to be discussed. But um, I, I thought we could maybe today on, on this episode, I would just talk a little bit about um, about... Uh, some some kind of basic uh, libertarian anarcho-capitalist Austrian economics uh, things that uh, that really influenced my um, my thinking. So I, I was thinking I would spend a little bit of time talking about um, uh, praxeology and argumentation ethics. And um, I, I guess what kind of got me thinking that today would be it would be a good episode for that was uh, just watching you know, some cable news and, and what was kind of jumping out at me was just how, how, how inconsistent logically, uh, they all are. And, you know, this, this has kind of been a, a major theme of, of mine for years now that I, I feel like, uh, libertarians are the, are the only ones who are consistent and actually, you know, uh, don't contradict themselves every five seconds. And, you know, th this is one of the things that, drew me into this game and with whether it was Ron Paul or or Murray Rothbard or Tom Woods or any of these guys um you know this is one of the things that really attracted me to this way of thinking and um and and you know one, one of the stories that uh, particularly um jumped out at me this morning and th this is something that Fox News is really running with was that um there was a a, a democrat uh this guy in in New York right here, my home state, uh, a, a, a congressman um, who made a comment about, uh, he, he was doing a town hall, and he basically suggested that citizens may need to, uh, to take up arms against Donald Trump. Uh, and, and of course, you know, Fox News is the only ones who are really reporting on this, and, and they're jumping all over it. And... Um, you know, so so basically what he said was that, um, okay, here, I have the quote in front of me, uh, and, and the guy's name is Tom Susie, something, something I might be mispronouncing that last name, but I, he said they, they were basically asking him what would happen if, uh, if, if 
you know, the judges ruled against Trump and he didn't listen to him and, and you know, kind of, I, I, I don't know, like, you know, started be, becoming a, an unlawful tyrant. Imagine that out of a president. It's hard, hard to imagine. It's only been done by every single one of them. But anyway, what he said was, and this is the quote, I mean, this is where the Second Amendment comes in, quite frankly, because, you know, what if the president was to ignore the courts? What would you do? What would we do? Uh, it's really a matter of public uh, of putting public pressure on the president. So uh, right away, Fox News jumps on the story, and their angle is, you know, which I, I don't completely disagree with. It's like a fair point, but they're saying like, well, what if someone had had said this about Obama? And of course, we all know that if someone had said this about Obama, this would be the top story on MSNBC, on CNN. Um, it would be all over the place. Hollywood would be talking about it. But since it uh, it, it was lodged against Trump, they don't care. Um, and okay, that's a fair point. But at, at the same on the same token, uh, if someone had said this about Obama while all those guys were were freaking out, Fox News would have said like, "Well, that's what the Second Amendment is for," and that's you know this is this is you know they would have been talking about the tyrannical, oppressive Obama regime. So it, it just kind of is, it's just one of these stories where it just kind of exposes everybody's hypocrisy and logical inconsistencies. And to be honest, I actually kind of liked uh, uh, hearing this because it was just kind of like, oh, well, it's nice that, um, it, it's nice that there's a Democrat who's acknowledging what the Second Amendment is for, you know? So that's that's nice. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. The, the idea of guns is... Uh, is to to uh, be a hedge against a tyrannical government and, if necessary, to fight a tyrannical government. And there's a reason why tyrannical governments always want to take away your guns. It's it's a great position to just watch the left be in, where you know they're they're simultaneously trying to argue that you know that we we've, we've had a you know a fascist regime has taken over in this country, but also we don't need guns. Um, so anyway, I, it reminds me back of when. Um, Michael Wood Jr. was on the show, and I had him on uh, at, at one time when he was arguing, you know, uh, uh, that basically for gun confiscation, that no one has the right to uh, own guns. And then he was at least honest enough to admit that the Trump election had given him pause on that, and he had to rethink it a little bit. Because once you're arguing that your your government is, uh, your, you know, that the president wants to round people up uh, and, and deport them, well, what's a... What's a really good way to stop that? I mean, if you really see it as that much of a humanitarian issue, then yeah, I, I guess the, the next logical step would be to, uh, to resist, to resist that. So anyway, I guess what I'm getting at there when I say the next logical step is that it just seems like none of these guys are following logical steps. And it, it's, you know, I've, this is something I've grappled with for a while now, but it seems uh, the conclusion that I've basically come to when you, you see all these guys contradicting themselves or, or not following a logical path is, is just that, well, if, if they were consistent thinkers, they'd be libertarians. And this is why they're not. So there, that pretty much sums it up in itself. And, and you'll see whether it's, uh, you know, on, whether it's, it's the lefties or the righties, they, they never seem to have any problem, you know, contradicting themselves and their and their own beliefs and you see this all over the place so um there uh i mean there's there's countless examples but the you know the the um people on the right and all the way from like you know the mainstream republicans to like you know ben shapiro or or any of those type of guys you know they can they can easily just say like oh well we're for small government and a constitutional republic you know so we want small government but the the military is underfunded, right? So you have the largest military in the history of humanity, the biggest you know military budget ever, and that's not enough. But we're still for small government. Well, of, of course you're not. Or you know, we're um, we you know we're we're for gun rights, but we blindly praise the police, who would be the people who would come round up your guns. And in fact, in lots of states across the world, are are rounding up guns. I mean, look at uh, you just look at somewhere like Chicago, where they have very strict gun control and people like the NRA and people like that will make the argument that, well, you know, the only thing the gun control does is it uh, it disarms the law abiding citizens. And of course, that's that's 100 percent true. Right. But just take this thing to its logical conclusion. 
So who's disarming the law-abiding citizens? The cops. The cops are. Have you ever heard any of them challenge the cops in Chicago? Well, no, they're just doing great work because that's, that, that's the wing of the government that we have to praise uh, without question. And then on, on the left, I mean, oh, geez, I, I don't even know. My favorite one, which I know I've mentioned before on the show, but my favorite is just the, you know, gender is a social construct. Of course, I know that I was born with the brain of a woman from the age I was five years old. It's like, okay, well, you can have one of those, but you sure as fuck can't have both. You can't say gender is a social construct and also that one brain matches a woman and one match that would be a biological construct. Um, but no one seems to care about any of this shit. And um, it, 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 it's, I, I shouldn't say nobody, it's the libertarians. And particularly like the ANCAP, Rothbardian, Austrian uh, economists. They're the ones who seem to be uh, obsessed with consistency. I remember Stefan Molyneux one time said he has uh, obsessive consistency disorder. And I very much liked that because that seems to to me like we're we're the only group who really um, seems to have have a need to not contradict ourselves. So I thought I'd get into a couple of these, uh, you know, like kind of, you know, libertarian philosophical constructs. And just to preface the, the stuff I'm going to talk about, I'm, you know, not an expert in any of this shit, but. As you guys know who listen to my show, that's that's never stopped me from diving into anything. I'm I'm very willing to go above my pay grade. Um, but I just find these ideas really interesting. And, and if you want to learn more about them or, or get like a deeper academic understanding of them, I'll certainly point you in the direction of, of the right people to read. Um, and particularly with the stuff I'm going to be talking about today, it's really uh, Ludwig von Mises and Hans Hermann Hoppe. And um, and Murray Rothbard too, of course. For for the Ludwig von Mises stuff, also I really highly represent uh, recommend uh, Bob Murphy, who I've had on the show a few times. But I actually think for if you're like um, uh, like a complete novice at this stuff, and you want to get into like understanding praxeology and and the, the Austrian economics, I actually recommend Bob Murphy's Choice. I think you should read Choice first, and then read Human Action after, uh, because it's it's just easier for non-academics like myself to understand that way. Because what Bob Murphy did with choice was he basically took human action and tried to to break it down in like a more digestible fashion for a, for, you know, a mass audience. Uh, it's a really fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, okay, so uh, the, I, I'm going to like use some terms in this episode, but I'll, I'll break them down because they I know they can be like a little bit intimidating if you don't know what the, all of them mean, but it's it's really not that complicated uh, 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 stuff. It's just, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you can be lost in terminology. And again, I think there's uh, a lot of times, you know, Scott Horton made this analogy to me, but he, he was, uh, you know, I was talking to him and I was like, God damn, like you just know everything about these wars and every single, uh, um, you know, player and every single, you know, the, everything about every timeline. And, and, you know, he made the point that, this is not beyond the grasp of the average person and he he the example he used was like if you listen to sports radio you and when people are calling in he was like you know you'll have some guy call in and he knows everything he knows as much as the guy who's who's uh, running the show does they know every single ball and strike that's been thrown for the last 13 years and that's because they get into it and it's that simple you can learn this stuff and uh i'm sure if you've if you've never really watched baseball and you just turn on a game and there, there's all this terminology you don't understand and you know he's like oh that there was a strike on the inside corner he's trying to brush him back because this one's trying to get a sacrifice fly and you know we just had a, a balk and then this guy you know and it's like you you're like, wait, I don't understand what's going on. But that doesn't mean that it's like beyond your ability to to get it. It's just, you know, it, it, you got to put a little bit of time into into learning this stuff. And then before you know it, you're a, you know, you, you, you're a master. Okay. Um, so, or at least you, you're fluent in understanding it. So uh, Ludwig von Mises, who's the greatest economist to ever live, he um the he described his uh his economic thinking as a praxeological exercise and praxeology for anyone who doesn't know the term it's really you can just think of it as um as the logic of economics that's all that it means is that we're we're basing this in logic 
um, praxeology. It, it's a, a deductive study of human action. So it, in other words, what Mises was saying was that when, when you're studying economics, it's not like physics or chemistry. It, because, it, you know, it, it's not just like, oh, we mix this chemical with this chemical and it bonds and forms this. That, that's not how you can, you, you can't view economics that way because what economics is, is human action, which is human beings acting. And th that it, it just, you'd be missing the point completely if you don't take into account that human beings are these like psychological creatures with emotions and desires. And it's not, it's not the same thing as just chemicals working together. And he also made the point that since we are humans, and we're talking about how other humans act, there's certain things we know about human beings. Again, so th this separates economics from some other uh, hard sciences where, you know, um, if, you're, if you're studying whatever, if you're like a, a geologist and you're studying some rock, you're not a rock. You're a human being studying a rock. So it's not the same thing as, as economics where it's human beings studying other human beings actions um okay so just th that right there and um and just to get some other uh terms out of the way um because uh praxeology is relying on logic uh mises basically uh, uh realized that there are things that we can know a priori that's another term you'll heard you're used a lot in in Austrian economics, and all that, um, what, what a priori means is that there's something that you can know, there's something that you can understand that's logically deduced. So in other words, it's, it's, um, it's reasoning or understanding something uh, from a theoretical deduction, not, not from something that you've observed, but from something that you, you can understand through logic a priori. Um, and then the other term that I, I might use a little bit is is axiomatic, which again means uh, um, meaning something that is self evident, that that's unquestionable. So all these things are kind of interrelated, but the, the terms can be just like a little bit intimidating. So anyway, so what what Mises starts off the 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 axiom that he starts off with is human action, and he basically um, said that the the, the starting point for understanding uh, economics is that humans act that humans act purposefully and that they act what he would call rationally which but when he's saying rationally it doesn't mean like oh this is you know it, not like in the the uh kind of common usage of the term rational but just meaning that they they were acting toward an end so even you know just for example I, Mises wouldn't have used this example I don't think but just uh, to make you understand like you know if someone commits suicide you might say like in the common use of the word rational you might say well that was irrational he he wasn't thinking it through but in in the way that Mises is using the word he he was acting rational because it's somebody who had a desire his desire was to die and so he purp purposely acted to kill himself so like it's you know he's acting toward an end and of course it just seems obvious to me that like this is the only way to think about economics it's the only way that makes any sense i mean if you if if someone goes to a store and they buy a hat for twenty dollars right th this isn't mixing like hydrogen with oxygen it's that that's not what's going on here it's not just simply here's a mix of chemicals and this is going to be the reaction and this is what we'll create from from th this mixture it's like it's it's a subjective value statement uh, about what somebody wants versus what somebody else wants and then they act in order to to achieve that so we can deduce from that that the person buying the hat valued the hat at more than twenty dollars and the person who sold the hat valued the twenty dollars as more than the hat if they're making this voluntary trade and they're both acting with purpose uh, then then we, we can understand that that that's obviously what's going on it's self-evident okay so we can know this a priori it's it's a self-evident observation and um really to me this is the only way to think about economics and and it's and and of course when when you when you un, when you look at things logically like this you can be certain you like like certainty can come from these logical uh deductive uh, understandings so in other words, like 
if, if what Mises is starting with is saying uh, humans act, okay, and, and humans act purposefully, how can you disprove that? I mean, what, what study could you run in, in order to try to disprove that? Well, here's the problem. As soon as you start running a study, you are acting purposefully. So you can't act purposefully to disprove that humans act purposefully without contradicting yourself. Okay? So it, now another a criticism that gets thrown at Austrian economics all the time is that uh, it's, it's non-scientific. I'm sure for anybody who's like, looked into Austrian economics uh, uh, even just a little bit, you've heard people who have made that point before, like, well, this isn't scientific because you're not gathering this information empirically. Uh, you're just, you know, deducing it from your mind. But this is just utter nonsense. This is, this is just ridiculous because, truthfully speaking, this is all of science. Uh, Bob Murphy made this point once, and I think it, this, this summed it up perfectly for me, but he, he basically what he was saying was, where, well, where do you get the scientific method from? I mean, wh where do you find the scientific method? It's not as if Moses came down from a mountain with the scientific method, uh, you know, uh, in, in some stone tablets and said, this is the word of God, we must follow this. Uh, the scientific method was created by human beings using their their rational capacities and so you know the scientific method right that we've i'm sure all of us like learned in fifth grade or some version of which is you know more or less like uh you know like what is it it's like you you make an observation um the, uh then you you, you uh, ask a question then you form a hypothesis then you test a hypothesis then you have the results from the test then you draw a conclusion and replicate right like this is the, the the idea now all of that even even if you're doing this in in a sense and then after that you're going to get some empirical data or whatever the where does that come from like why is that a good way to go about science why should we do it that way why should i not just have a hypothesis and then say that's correct or that's not correct well, the reason is because you think about this logically, and there's a lot of um, there there's a lot of um, presuppositions. Like there, there's a lot of things that you have to accept in order to get to the scientific method that you might not even question, you might not even uh, um, or, or you might not even think about. I should say. So it's it's they're, they're just assumptions that are built in, and like one of the assumptions that that's built into the scientific method is that reality is objective that reality exists that you know what i mean that like like so that that's something that's just an assumption otherwise you wouldn't even be going about uh the scientific method you wouldn't be going uh, about science and like um that that's just something that you can't get around and the, and the other thing that's that's kind of an assumption is that um uh so reality is objective that we can observe reality using our five senses and that we can um, that we can interpret reality uh, using our our intellectual capacities. Like that's all something that's just assumed if you want to uh, you know engage in science at all. So the scientific method is something that we logically work out, and it makes a lot of sense. Like that that is a really good way to go about getting information. But it again, it's not something that was just like. The scientific method didn't appear anywhere in nature. Human beings had to think about this and kind of work it out. And that's so so this is right at the basis of all science. It's not something that's that's unique to Misesian praxeology. And um, so so anyway, I think those criticisms of Austrian economics are just crazy. But what they'll say, like what Milton Friedman said when he was um, when he was uh, um trashing Austrian economics was that he said like, well, you know, if, if uh, two Austrian e economists disagree, because basically one of them, you know, the only way I guess Austrian economists can disagree is if someone thinks you've made an error in your logic, which is certainly possible. Um, but so he, he was saying like, well, there's no way to prove it then. They just, they just have to, I think at one point he said, they just have to fight if they disagree. But really, if you look at it, there's plenty of disagreement within within mainstream economics who reject the whole praxeological uh, framework. And the, well, look, there's disagreements between Austrian econom uh, Austrian economists, and they haven't they they haven't started fighting physically yet. 
And there's, there's, it's not as if they come to any better conclusions because they go with this method of, of empirically testing stuff where they're just kind of lost and not actually starting from any, any like grounded foundation. So just like, for example, right, like you could have like the Chicago School of Economics and the Keynesian School of Economics, which are two like fairly mainstream economic schools. So um, say so the, the most like popular, I guess of the Chicago School uh, economists was Milton Friedman, and the most popular, today at least, of the Keynesians, I, I would say, is Paul Krugman, right? So these two guys completely disagree about the minimum wage. They're absolutely on, on opposite sides of that issue. Uh, Milton Friedman used to say that we should abolish the minimum wage, um, and and uh, Paul Krugman says that we should we should raise the minimum wage. And they both have economic reasons. Forget the, the moral reasons attached to it. They both have economic reasons for it. So Milton Friedman says it will help the economy uh, if we abolish the, the minimum wage. And Paul Krugman says it will help the economy if we increase it. So Milton Friedman's argument would be something about how, you know, we price low-skilled uh, people out of the job market and that this would give, you know, you know businesses could hire people for less money and then they wouldn't have to pass costs of the labor onto their uh, consumers so prices will be cheaper and this will help the economy and um, you know uh, Paul Krugman's argument would go something like oh well if we pay people more then that raises the standard of living there's uh, you know they put that money right back into the economy and so and so so you know so so these are the two disagreeing positions right and they both will they both schools have done a ton of um empirical testing to try to prove their point and both of them have different studies that they can point to and different things there's been no resolution of this issue they're both still on different sides and and the problem is that so you could look at um one state where they raised the minimum wage and employment went down and then you could look at one state where they raised the minimum wage and employment went up. And there are examples of both. Uh, but, of course, the problem is that there's like thousands, if not tens of thousands of different factors that go into why employment would raise or go up, right? So you, you could be looking at one state and say they raised the minimum wage uh, and, and um, I, I don't know, like, you know, employment went up. So does that prove that raising the minimum wage increases employment? Well, no, of course not, because there's all these different factors. Maybe they cut taxes that year, and that led to an increase in, in jobs. Or maybe, like, you know, just some other market phenomenon. Like, maybe it was a really good, like, harvest season, and there were more crops, and there was more wealth. Or, there, you know, like, there's, there's tons of different factors that could go in. Maybe somebody who's a really great entrepreneur just fucking invented something in that state that year, and that led to a, a whole bunch of jobs. There's all of these different factors, and it's impossible to test for every single one of them. So what ends up happening is whoever wants, you, you can always find what you're looking for. You know, like people have said that, like, you, statistics can always prove whatever you want them to. So you can always, so basically you don't get anywhere. And that's, bas that, that's a summation of modern, economy, uh, of modern economics. Like, nobody gets anywhere because we're not agreeing on basic principles. So, anyway, I just wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit because then getting into argumentation ethics, uh, which was uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, uh, theory. And I think that, to me, this this is like something really groundbreaking and, and really interesting. And... Uh, again, like if, if if this is interesting to you at all, I'll just recommend you guys go go look that up. So, like I said, Bob Murphy's Choice and uh, Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, and then for this, you know, you can just look up Hoppe Argumentation Ethics. He's he's written about it in a few different areas. Um, but uh, so what? So Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, you know, what, I think he 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 was he's a German economist. And he, I think initially he was like a, a socialist, or at least he was some type of left-wing guy. And then he started studying Mises and studying Rothbard, and uh, he ended up coming over to America, I think maybe in like the 70s or, or something like that. And, um, and he, he studied under Murray Rothbard for a while. Interesting uh, little side note. So Hoppe was uh, a German, and he came over here and, uh, and studied under a Jew. 
And, you know, if you know, Germans and Jews have had their problems in the past. And I know that seems like, you know, ancient history now, but this was like, you know, I, I'm not sure if it was, it might have been like the 70s or it, 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 I think it was at latest the 70s. I think it, by the 80s he was already over here and, and writing and doing work. But, you know, it's like this is, you know, only a, a few decades after uh, some of these problems. But isn't that just something beautiful about uh, libertarianism there, right? Brings people together. Even the Germans and the Jews can get along when you're a Rothbardian, Misesian libertarian. Um, okay, so what Hans Hermann Hoppe did was he created this thing that he calls argumentation ethics. He created this theory. And basically the theory, well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, again, I'm, I'm really giving you like the layman's kind of view on this. It's not a, like an academic take. And some of this is like my interpretation. So I recommend if you're interested, go go straight to the to the source. But more or less what, what argumentation ethics uh, to me proves is that it's impossible. It's impossible to argue against libertarianism without contradicting yourself. Okay, so it's impossible to to not um, not have some element of hypocrisy of self contradiction if you're arguing against libertarianism. And just like to like for like a, a quick kind of like example, because you see them all over the place, like in, in modern political arguments, you see self-contradictory arguments all over the place. So uh, like just an example, right, just like really basic shit. Um, but like if you like a self-contradictory statement would be like, um, like, uh, I do not exist. OK, so that's a self-contradictory statement because you're you're saying I. So you're recognizing yourself as an entity. And then you're saying you don't exist, right? So even something like that, as simple as that, it's like that's that's a self-contradictory statement. You can't, if you recognize I, then you must exist because you just recognized who you are, right? So, um, or, or whatever, if I, if I were to say like, um, I don't have a voice, that's a self-contradictory statement because I'm, I'm using my voice to tell you this information. If I didn't have a voice, why would I even be bother? Why would I bother saying this? You get what I'm going for here? Okay, so what, what Hans Hermann Hoppe uh, said, was he basically took the Misesian model, right, of, of an axiomatic starting point for, for, to work out a whole, a whole structure. So what Mises started with was action, that human beings act. And like I said before, is if you're an economist and you want to try to disprove that human beings act, well, whatever experiment you're going to run to try to disprove that, you're going to have to act in order to do it. So you can't do it without contradicting yourself. You, you'd have to accept this as reality. Um, so what Hans Hermann Hoppe, his, his axiomatic starting point was argumentation. And he basically said that uh, in, in, any of this, in any political discourse, what we all do is we argue. And of course, this would be true right for everybody today, whether whether it's, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, any of this stuff. Everybody who's on there, every single one of these people is arguing They're they're I mean, I'm not going by like the technical definition of whether they're, you know, you know, the Stefan Molyneux, like not an argument stuff like which there's there's a lot of important points there. But just making the point that they are putting forth what they would call an argument. Right. And so just like with the Misesian stuff, uh, try disagreeing with that axiomatic starting point, right? I mean, how are you going to argue against the idea that humans argue without, you know, falling into this self-contradictory stuff? So it's, it's obviously a contradiction if you're going to argue that human beings don't argue, all right? So then what, what, what Hoppe basically builds off of that is that there, so there, there are these assumptions, just like I was saying with the scientific method, there are these assumptions built into arguing that, that are undeniable, that you might not even think about, but they exist if, if you're going to argue with people. Just a, as an aside, one, one a thing that I always you know, take about, that I take into my own personal life that, that I kind of got from argumentation ethics is the idea of, just to keep it simple, to me, it's like any comedian being against free speech, right? Like you're just right away a complete hypocrite 
If there's any comedian who doesn't defend free speech, you're, you're an absolute hypocrite because it's something that's essential in order to do comedy. We can't do what we do. We are exercising free speech. And in fact, we need free speech in, in order to be able, you, you have to have the freedom to say what you want if you're going to search for funny. So that right away, you're, that's, you know, you're, you're a hypocrite. You're contradicting yourself if you're a, a comedian who doesn't believe in free speech. And I would say the same thing for like a podcaster or anybody who, you know, speaks about any issues that, that are important to them. It's like, yeah, well, then you have to be for free speech because you're using that in order to, to do what you do. So one of, uh, so, so what Hoppe would say is that, um, if you're arguing what you're the the assumptions that are already made once you start to argue and the he would say that one of the assumptions is self ownership right because if i'm arguing then clearly one of the assumptions is that this is my argument if i'm arguing against you then i'm already assuming that that's your argument and this is my argument and we understand that your argument comes from your body, your brain, your vocal cords, or you know, your, if you're writing it down from your hand movement uh, or typing or whatever, right? So it's coming from me. I am creating it, and I am talking to you who is hearing it. So there's already a, a, a self-evident understanding that I own me and you own you, Right? Now, the, the other understanding is that I can persuade you. With my argument, I can persuade you. If I didn't believe I could persuade you, what's the point of arguing with somebody, right? Like, you, you wouldn't, um, uh, you're wouldn't. you not going to sit there arguing with an inanimate object because you know you can't persuade it of anything. You know that it can't hear you, it can't interpret this, it can't be persuaded. So once you're arguing with someone, you're already taking this as a given. You're already understanding this, right? And the fact that you're arguing and not beating someone over the head and threatening them means that you're the, the another assumption built in there is that it's preferable to resolve disputes without resorting to violence so you're just because you argue right which already you can't argue against because you would be arguing so this is something that we can we can know a priori that human beings argue it's an unbelievable axiomatic starting point Human beings argue. You can't argue against that. And once you do, once you argue, or once you acknowledge that we all argue, as everyone's doing in this game, you're also acknowledging that we own ourselves and that peaceful solutions to, um, to conflicts are preferable to violent solutions to conflicts. Okay? There's a whole bunch of amazing libertarian uh, philosophy that's just built right in to the idea that we argue with each other. Okay? So... Of course, then the connection from owning yourself and owning your argument, it, it's not far off uh, to, to get to property ownership, right? Because if you, if you own your argument and you're already acknowledging that we own our bodies and that you own the effects of your bodies, well, what is property other than an effect of your body, something that you created or improved upon or made? And you've already acknowledged that argumentation, a peaceful resolution to disputes, is preferable to violence. So the next step is that we want to, to have a society, if we're talking about anything, any type of ethics, the next step is that you want to have a society where you can, you can own yourself, you can own property, and you can find peaceful resolution to conflicts. Okay, there's a whole lot more in argumentation ethics. This is just like a really basic breakdown of it. But don't you find that stuff fucking fascinating? Like, to me, this is like some of the most interesting shit ever. And, and uh, I, you know, there's a lot out there on it if you want to go look into it. I, like I said, today is a short episode, so I'm, I, I can't really get into it uh, much further than that. But I just find this stuff to be some of the most interesting shit in the world. And it was dawning on me as I was sitting here, like, just blown away by how all these guys can just contradict themselves and how we're, like, the only consistent people. And I, it, it dawned on me that I, I don't think I've ever really talked about argumentation ethics uh, on on the podcast before, so I thought it was well worth uh, um, it was well worth spending a little bit of time uh, uh, talking about. And so anyway, the the uh, 
essential Hoppian position is that if you start off axiomatically with the fact that we argue, you get you can get logically just a few steps away to the non-aggression principle. Anyway, thought that was worth talking about. I apologize for the short episode, although we did go a little bit long with Scott Horton. How great was that one, huh? I thought that was one of the most fascinating episodes I've, I've had yet. That guy is just packed full of knowledge. My, uh, my fiance has uh, said to me before, and she said, Scott Horton's the only person I, I get on the phone with uh, that I'm quiet with. She, sa- she says, he's the, he's the only person you get on the phone where you're not talking a mile a minute. And I'm just sitting there listening, going, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, great point. Anyway. Also, really fun episode with uh, with BK Chris the week before. So, if you guys haven't listened to those, go listen to them. Come check me out in Boston, in Los Angeles, and uh, okay, I will. Uh, we'll be back on Friday with a brand new episode. Peace.